Hi boys and girls, auntie and uncle, Pachi and Machi, welcome back to my channel. My name is CK and my channel is Seekology. First of all, I would like to say a very big thank you for the overwhelming support you guys gave me for my first bio series featuring Anwar Ibrahim. I've gotten hundreds of comments on the first hour of upload alone. Along came with a lot of comments to help me better my future bio series videos. So thank you for that. Keep those comments coming. Featuring Anwar Ibrahim was not my original plan. My original plan was today's protagonist. The year was 1993 and Malaysia is experiencing unprecedented economic growth and Anwar was just appointed as Deputy Prime Minister of Malaysia. Kuala Lumpur stock exchange is roaring and Malaysia's GDP at its highest. Then came a murder that would left all Malaysian draw dropped and shocked with the amount of violence committed along with a murdered, dismembered corpses and cannibalism. Many were left in disbelief that a beautiful pop star would be the main culprit. Our protagonist today has certainly cemented herself as the most prolific female killer in Malaysian history. This is the bizarre story of Mona Fenty. Mona was born Noor Masna Ismail on 15 January 1956 in Gangar, the state of Perlis in Northern Peninsula, Malaysia. She claimed to have royal lineage but has never explained from which royal family branches she is from. Mona's thirst for the spotlight began at a very young age. Her interest in performance blossomed as she grew up. Mona started to venture into the music industry in her early 20s. She then had three marriages and several children. In the early 1980s, she met her fourth husband, Muhammad Noor Afendi Abdul Rahman. The couple was a match made in heaven, or should I say hell, as Afendi doted on his new wife and has promised to give everything to support Mona in her fledging pop star career. Together, they would have one daughter and two stepsons. Together with Avendi's fun, Mona would launch her first album titled Diana. During her time as a singer, Mona made several TV appearances, but unfortunately, she was not successful in the music industry, forcing the couple to seek other means of income. Mona then became a shaman and a medicine woman. Witchcraft was very popular at the time, especially around Kuala Lumpur, and Mona would offer her services to many wealthy and powerful clients, including many high-profile politicians. Her clients were willing to pay large amount of money for the couple's services in search of fame and higher social status. Despite having a rather short stint in the music industry, Mona lived lavishly, mostly from the money she earned from being a witch doctor. Mona owned quite a few bungalows and houses across Malaysia, but strangely, she didn't like to stay in them. She rather preferred to stay in all the five-star hotels around Kuala Lumpur, a very early adopter of staycation. Mona also possessed a collection of luxury cars, including a Mercedes, a Jaguar, and a station wagon. True to her diva nature, Mona loved to shop and paid to have a facelift done. In the 90s, those were high status and covetable items. True to her form, in her later murder trial, Mona would wear expensive outfit to the court every day she stood trial, making sure she was always dressed to the nines for the camera. One of her many wealthy clients included an Amno party member named Maslan Idris. In July 1993, the Batu Talam assembly men in the state of Pahang had came to the couple for supernatural help to boost his career and to climb 
the party ladder in Amno. Maslan was reported missing on July 2nd after withdrawing a total of 300,000 ringgit from the bank and left a message to his family that he was leading for Raubt in the state of Pahang. A week after the police had been looking for him, the big break came when police found an unlikely source. A police in Pahang was out in patrol when he came across a man high on drugs. The young man turned out to be a 23-year-old named Juraini Husin. The police arrested the young man and took him into the station for questioning. At this point, Juraini was only facing the prospect of a little jail time at the absolute worst. But before he could sober up, he actually ended up implicating himself in a more serious crime. His statement was rambling and incoherent at first, but the police were able to pick up some critical pieces of information, and most importantly, a name, Maslan Idris. It appeared that Juraini was going to confess to being involved in the disappearance of the high-profile politician. The police director of Bukit Aman at the time, Zaman Khan's team quickly honed in on the couple who had reportedly sold off Maslan's Mercedes to a Chinese businessman in Budu, Kuala Lumpur. They were on a shopping spree around Kuala Lumpur. The press reported that they had spent a whopping 315,000 ringgit in just a few days, almost the same amount of money that Maslan withdrew from the bank before his disappearance. Mona, her husband and Juraimi were immediately arrested and the most highly publicized murder trial of the decade in Malaysia would begin. On 22nd July, 20 days after the arrest, a Fendi guided court police Ainul Asman's team to where Maslan's body was buried. He also guided the police to where the murder weapons were buried, an axe and two knives. They were then tried in the Tremolo High Court by seven member jury presided by Judge Mokhtar Sidin. According to testimonial, Maslan was persuaded by the couple to take part in a ritual. Mona and her husband promised to help Maslan by giving him a talisman, a crane, and a songko, which were reportedly owned by former president of Indonesia, Sukarno. Once Maslan reached the house, he was taken to the kitchen in which there was a raised platform and he was asked to lay on a slab while the couple performed a flower bath ritual. When the ritual reached its climax, Mona said to her soon victim, put your head back, close your eyes, and you will hear money falling from the sky. No money fell. Instead, it was a blade of an axe. As Maslan breathed his last second, Juraimi swung an axe on his neck thrice, severing his head. Maslan's body was then decapitated in 18 pieces by Juraimi and then dismembered and partially skinned and buried in a shallow pit. At the trial, the shaman couple turned on their assistant Juraimi, saying it was Juraimi who was the one who decided to spice up the ritual by an impromptu beheading, while all other clients left with their head still intact. Juraimi's version of the event is probably closer to the truth. He said that he killed the politician upon the instruction of his employer, Afendi. And he also made statement in the court saying that he was under a trance brought about by the couple's black magic. The Royal Chief of Police Investigator at the time, Mapo Ja'afar explained 
that Juraimi acknowledged his relationship with Afendi as that of an adopted father figure and has always dutifully followed Afendi's instructions. In addition, many witnesses of the shopkeepers and bank clerks attested to having served Mona and Effendi, stating the couple were buying up many luxury items days after the killing. Afendi, in his defense said Maslan owed him 2 million ringgit for the magic cane and songko. Mona also testified that she gave similar items to other high-profile politicians to boost their popularity with their electorate. Throughout the trial, Mona exhibited none of the usual behavior you would expect from a suspected murderer. She was always cheerful, flashing her smile and posing for press photographer. She dressed brightly and colorfully. She remarked, looks like I have many fans. At one point in the trial, she even offered to sing for the judge. She was at a center of a media frenzy, laughing out all the attention for herself with almost 2,000 journalists waiting outside the small Thermalo courthouse, all trying to catch a glimpse of the trio. Finally, she has gotten what she's craved for all her life, fame and sadly, notoriety. Rumors started swirling around the country saying she was to sacrifice eight lives to reach witchcraft superpower and Maslan was victim number seven as six other missing women's cases were to be linked to her. I want my video to be more about facts rather than rumors of black magic. According to Kajang prison officer Sergeant Aziza, who was stationed to guard Mona throughout her days in prison until the end, she witnessed Mona performing the five compulsory prayers in Islam each day. She continues to speak positively about her inmate and gave statement to the press saying that she saw Mona always reciting the Quran. The sergeant found her to be very chatty and were never out of topics of conversation, even though most inmates will try to avoid her at all costs. The two ladies even shared cooking tips and was forthcoming about stories of Mona's children. Mona called her Jaija and Sergeant Aziza would call her Auntie Mona. At one point, Sergeant Aziza even asked Mona, is it true that people were saying you leave the jail in the middle of the night and went sightseeing in Chowkit? In which Mona replied, if I have superpower, do you think I would want to go to Chowkit? Which I think actually makes sense her answer. Her ex-husband happens to be a police officer and also her children swear by her character saying that she would never even dare to kill an ant and while she was cooking preparing fish she would often break down in tears let alone dismembering a human body. After seeing 65 days of evidence and from 76 witnesses in the trial on February 1995, the Tamerlo High Court meted out the death sentence on the trio. It took the seven jury member only 17 minutes to deliver the sentence and reach unanimous verdict of guilty against all three defendants. After hearing her sentence passed, Mona said, I am happy. Thank you for all Malaysians. The three convicted killer appealed against the sentence until all their avenues to overturn it exhausted in 1997. On November 2, 2001, Mona, age 45, Afandi, age 44, and Juraimi, age 31, were hanged in Kajang prison at 6 a.m. in the morning. To me, Mona was just an ambitious woman who fell in way too deep with black magic and lost her way. So as Malaysian society at the time, 
which was very greedy and was trying to seek even more wealth in any possible way. My story of the prolific killer Mona Fendi ends right here, but I do want you to know that this case left a huge impact on the country's legal system. The madness of the whole media coverage and the public's obsession was actually part to blame for the abolition of trial by jury here in Malaysia. The official reasons cited were problems in getting people to attend jury duty and participants would very easily manipulated by the media coverage. Hence, Mona's trial was the last trial in Malaysia to have trial by jury. Five years after the trio's execution, filming for a movie version of the story got underway. The production was stuck in limbo for many years with problems with Malaysia's censors. Only 12 years later, it was given permission by FINA's Malaysian Film Agency for public release. It was finally released in 2018 after more than a decade on the shelf entitled Dukun. The film netted 1.5 million ringgit on its first day of screening throughout Malaysia and Brunei, the highest opening night gross for Astro Shaw, which accumulated to 6.2 million after four days of release. It is now 30 years since the murder trial. Her name is now more legendary than ever. Even with the recent 15 general election, the public were tweeting her to return to banish corrupt politicians who had ruined the country. The murder scene were visited by many people since, according to local people living there. And you can find an average of one new Mona YouTube videos every month. There are no winners in this sad story, unfortunately. Mona's children and family has to go on hiding from public eye. As a Muslim family, they always have to relive this horror every time Mona's name is mentioned on the press and social media. And I try my hardest to respect all the victims in the making of my video. As Dante quoted, there are no greater sorrows than to recall our joy in times of wretchedness. I pray all victims rest in peace. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you enjoy my telling of the story of Mona Fendi. If you'd like to see more famous and infamous Malaysian, then click right here for my video of Anwar Ibrahim. You can help support my channel by buying me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash psychology and I shall see you in my next video. Selamat tinggal!